Hello everybody, my name's Terry, I'm the board modeler, and this is the Heinkel HE162A Volksjäger by Dragon in 1 to 70 second scale. This is what I'm going to be reviewing in this episode, so let's get the box open, see what's inside, and then let's get started. Let's start off this build by taking a look at what we get in the box. And, well, there really isn't that much in there, to be honest. That's to be expected, as the Heinkel HE-162 wasn't a very large aircraft, but all that empty space did lead to a couple of parts getting detached from the sprues as the contents shifted around during transit. Fortunately, they weren't damaged, which is a good thing, as the parts in this kit are very well moulded. A lot of the detail parts are nicely tooled and very cleanly moulded, especially considering their small size, and there's a high level of moulded detail, especially in the cockpit and on the engine. And when I say the engine, I don't just mean the usual two fans in a large tube that you get in most 1 to 70 second scale kits, because Dragon has included a fully detailed representation of the Heinkel's turbojet power plant in this model. To further improve the already very nice detail in this kit, Dragon, as they often do, have included a few photo etched metal parts to add detail to the cockpit, landing gear and engine. As you can probably see, they're very nicely done but also very small, which led to a couple of issues in the build process as I'll explain later. Finally, let's examine the canopy, which is unfortunately a bit on the fuzzy side. It's not a major issue, as it can be polished out later, but it is a bit strange considering how well the rest of the kit's parts are moulded. The decal sheet provides markings for aircraft from two different squadrons. They're sharply defined and printed very well. And as for the instructions, they're very clearly laid out, and on the whole, they're pretty easy to understand. The only issue I had was with the way the colours were indicated. See, instead of using a consistent shading or cross-hatching for each colour, the shading is used to indicate different colours in different steps. Although this can get a bit confusing, the colours are called out in each step, so you should be okay as long as you read the instructions carefully. And that's exactly what I plan to do right now, because we're about to start building. Shall we? We're starting off the build by assembling the cockpit parts, because the HE-162 is an aircraft and that's pretty much how all aircraft kits begin. This combined nose wheel bay and cockpit floor is the first of three sub-assemblies that make up the cockpit on this tiny plane. And to complete the sub-assembly, all I have to do is attach the joystick, being very careful not to launch this minuscule part off the table while I do so. While I wait for the glue to dry on that, I'll take care of the seat. It comes in two parts, which fit together reasonably well, and form a nice solid sub-assembly once the glue's dry. I'm also pleased to say that the 162's tiny seat has a lot of nice detail on it. Most of it will unfortunately be a bit hard to see in the aircraft's cramped cockpit, but despite that, well done to Dragon for including it. And we're almost done with the small parts, well, for now at least, because we're going to tackle the combined rudder pedal and instrument panel assembly. Apart from how small everything was, there weren't any major issues with fitting together the three plastic parts for this sub-assembly. Unfortunately though, I couldn't really say the same for the photo-etched instrument panel. The first issue I ran into was its small size. It wouldn't be so much of a problem if the part came ready to use, but in order to get everything to fit in place, you had to bend the top and side of this fingernail sized component with a decent amount of precision. Now I admit you're supposed to use a photo etch bending tool for this task, not a craft knife and a set of tweezers, but even then, the use of a flat sheet of photo etched metal for the instrument panel in this model makes the end result look like, well, a flat sheet of metal. I reckon that a 3D plastic panel put here 
would look a lot more detailed and be a bit easier to paint than this photo etched part. And speaking of painting, that's exactly what we're going to do now. First, I'll airbrush the cockpit parts with the base coat of German grey. And then pick out details like seat cushions. And the switches and dials on the instrument panel. I've got to say that despite the extra effort involved with the tiny parts in the Heinkel's cockpit, all the detail in there goes a long way towards making the finished product look really good, especially with the canopy open. But we'll get to that later. For now let's turn our attention to the main landing gear bay, and there are some more small parts for us to deal with here. That said though, the fit was generally good. In fact, the biggest issue I had was with part M10 the photo etched metal beam that I just attached. There's a hole roughly in the centre of this beam that another part, A24, is supposed to go through. For this kit, I had to drill out the hole slightly, as unfortunately, part A24 was a bit too wide. Apart from that issue, I didn't really have many problems with the landing gear bay. In fact, I was impressed by how well all the small plastic parts fitted together and just how detailed the finished product turned out. While I finish off the main wheel bay, here's an interesting fact for you. In order to save on the time and cost of developing new landing gear for the 162, Heinkel reused the main landing gear from the Messerschmitt BF109K fighter, the aircraft that the HE-162 was designed to replace in operational service. Ok, that's probably enough interesting facts for now, because the landing gear bay is mostly finished, so I'll give it a coat of RLM-02 which incidentally is some paint I had left over from the last Heinkel I built, the HE-70 airliner. And once that was dry, I attached the hydraulic lines, including part A24, which fit perfectly now that I'd widened the hole in part M10. Well, with the hydraulic lines in place and the rear bulkhead attached, I was all done with the main landing gear bay. And after I finished the nose wheel bay by adding the tiny clear sighting window, it was time to combine all the sub-assemblies together in the fuselage. This can be an opportunity for major fit issues, but fortunately, fuselage assembly for this kit was fairly painless. Just make sure that you've got all the sub-assemblies properly positioned before you start gluing. The small parts are pretty fragile, and could be broken if you try and force them together. Before we close up the fuselage, it is worth putting some weight in the nose of the aircraft to stop it sitting on its tail. A single fishing sinker was all I could fit in the Heinkel's tiny nose, but that turned out to be a bit too light to fully counter the Heinkel's heavy tail assembly. Once the superglue had dried on the nose weight, I glued together the two fuselage halves. and then assembled and attached the tail cone. The two halves of the tail fitted together well, but there was a rather large gap between the finished tail cone and the fuselage. So I filled in the tail, 
and corrected the slightly uneven fit of the nose section in my first round of sanding. And where there's sanding, there's an opportunity for me to put in some historical information about the aircraft I'm building. So, here goes then. The concept that would ultimately lead to the HE-162 was developed in the latter stages of the Second World War, when the German Luftwaffe found itself ill-equipped to hold off the increasing numbers of Allied bombers launching air raids against the Third Reich. Luftwaffe Chief Hermann Göring and Armaments Minister Albert Speer were faced with a shortage of materials to build fighters, fuel to keep them in the air, and experienced pilots to shoot down the enemy planes. To try and build a strong air force despite these problems, the Emergency Fighter Program, or Jägernotprogramm, was launched in July 1944. The program called for a small jet or rocket-powered interceptor that could be built out of non-strategic materials and flown by very inexperienced pilots. Pretty much all the aircraft companies in Germany submitted designs of some sort to the Air Ministry, with designs ranging from the very modern Blomann Voss P211 to the slightly crazy Fliegende Panzerfaust, a rocket-powered aircraft designed to ram into the side of enemy bombers put forward by the Zeppelin Company. By August 1944, the emergency fighter program was rationalised into the Volksjäger, or People's Fighter, design requirement. And by October that year, the Heinkel 162, a single-engine jet plane armed with two cannons, was announced as the winner. Heinkel's design was very advanced for its time, featuring a wooden monocoque fuselage, swept forward wings and tricycle landing gear. The plane was even fitted with an early ejection seat, in order to help the pilot escape the aircraft without being pulled into the jet intake behind the cockpit. Despite being such an advanced aircraft design, it only took Heinkel 90 days to get their jet fighter from design study to first flight, which took place on the 6th of December 1944. Let's take a break from the history lesson for a moment, because I've just finished sanding the fuselage, so we can keep building. Let's move on to the main landing gear doors. They come moulded as a single piece, but they need to be separated into three sections if you want to display the model with the wheels down. This does mean a bit of extra work, but fortunately Dragon moulded the part with extra deep panel lines, which means there's less chance of your blades slipping as you cut them apart. That Y-shaped part in the centre of the doors goes, you guessed it, in the centre of the landing gear bay. The fit here was pretty good, although some of the hydraulic lines in the bay were a bit too tall and tended to push it out of position. In all fairness though, that could have been because of me not pushing the lines down far enough when I glued them in place, but apart from that, this didn't really give me any problems. And neither did attaching the wings to the fuselage. The HE-162's wings are so small that in this kit each wing could be moulded as a single piece, rather than the usual top and bottom halves. This means a lot less clean-up work to make the wings look good, and that meant attaching the wings to the fuselage was a lot quicker and easier. While we wait for the glue to dry on the wings, let's move on to the Heinkel's tail surfaces. The three-part tail fits together well, although, as I mentioned before, it is quite heavy, so you'll need to add extra weight in the nose before closing up the fuselage to balance it out. Another thing to watch out for is the alignment of the vertical stabilisers. They should be aligned at right angles with the horizontal stabiliser, not perpendicular with the ground. The instructions don't make any note of this, but if you check your reference images, it's pretty obvious to see how the tail should look. Anyway, with the glue dry and the tail surface mostly aligned correctly, it's time to attach the completed tail to the back of the aircraft. There's a bit of a gap between the fuselage and the leading edge of the stabiliser which will require filling. But before we take care of that, I'll move to the front of the jet and add the gun sight to the cockpit. Unfortunately, before I could do that, the tiny fraction of a millimetre sized gun sight got launched out of my tweezers and into another dimension. I had to substitute it with a square of clear plastic, which I attached to the glare shield with white glue. I think that if this kit's taught me anything, it's that there is such a thing as too small when it comes to model parts. 
Fortunately, the cockpit canopy, which is the next part I'll be working on, can be seen by the naked eye. Unfortunately, as I mentioned at the start of the video, it's not perfectly clear. No matter though, I fix this by giving it a quick polish. Once that was done, I masked off the canopy and attached it to the aircraft. I'm attaching it closed for now, to make handling and painting the model easier, but I do want to display the finished aircraft with the canopy open. To make sure that I could remove the canopy once the painting was done, I only used a couple of drops of white glue on the rear section to hold it in place temporarily. And with both sections of the canopy attached, at least for the time being, it was now time for me to address the gaps around the wing roots, tail and under the fuselage. That means it's also time for part 2 of our history lesson on the HE-162. We finished off part 1 with the HE-162 making its first flight on the 6th of December 1944. The aircraft performed relatively successfully, but the test flight had to be cut short as the nose landing gear door had come off on a high speed run. Nevertheless, the prototype jet was repaired, and four days later, test pilot Gotthold Petter took it up again. Unfortunately, the aircraft suffered another structural failure, this time far more serious. A section of the wing detached, causing the aircraft to fall out of the sky and tragically killing Captain Petter, who had been unable to eject. The aircraft's entry into service was delayed as Heinkel investigated the cause of the crash. Both the fatal crash and the earlier incident with the landing gear door turned out to have been caused by the glue that was used on the aircraft's wooden structure. The original adhesive suppliers factory had been bombed by the Royal Air Force, so a substitute glue had to be found. This ersatz glue turned out to be highly acidic, and over time it would disintegrate the aircraft's wooden structure, but with the deadline looming, there was no time to wait for a better adhesive. The 162's wings were modified slightly to improve stability at low speed, and mass production began in July 1945. The HE-162 was designed from the outset to be built by unskilled labour, and in the Third Reich, this meant slave labour. Thousands of people were forced to work in horrifying conditions to set up and run three underground production lines that were hoped to deliver 1,000 aircraft a month. However, the shortages of resources and manpower meant that by February 1945, only 100 HE-162s were actually complete, and only a single unit, first staffel of Jagdgeschwader 1s, was actually equipped with them. Over the following months, JG-1 would claim several kills with the Heinkels, although the exact number has never been confirmed. What is known, however, is that 13 HE-162s were lost, along with 10 pilots, during April 1945. Most of these aircraft were lost due to fuel exhaustion, engine problems, or the structural failures that continued to plague the aircraft throughout its service history. By the end of the war, only 300 HE-162s had actually been built, and just 120 of them were in service. Many of the surviving 162s were taken by the Allies for evaluation, and were regarded highly by Western test pilots. Legendary British test pilot Captain Eric Winkle Brown praised the HE-162's controls as being the lightest and most effective controls he'd ever experienced. But a few months later, another British test pilot was killed when his HE-162 disintegrated in mid-air. Ultimately, the HE-162 as an aircraft was a brilliant design, but as a warplane, as a machine designed to save Germany from invasion and defeat, it was far too little, far too late to make a difference. And with the airframe all smoothed out, it's time to move on to one of this kit's main selling points, the fully detailed BMW turbojet engine. The basic structure of the engine is made up of four main parts, the two halves of the engine, the compressor fan in the front, and the exhaust section at the back. The fit of these parts was a bit, well, imprecise to be honest. There's a long and very noticeable seam running right along the top of the engine, and some fairly major gaps in the intake. I decided not to risk the detail on the engine and leave the gaps in place, but if you are striving for ultimate realism, fixing those fit issues will be quite a challenge. To further improve the detail on the engine, 
dragon includes a couple of photo etched metal pieces. Unlike the instrument panel and main landing gear bay, I think the photo etched metal works well on the engine, as it does a good job of adding fine detail and improving on the plastic parts. That said though, you will need to exercise extra care when attaching part M1, the long piece that wraps around the back of the engine. Test fit it a couple of times to make sure you've got the curve right before you break out the super glue and attach it permanently. While the glue dries on the engine, I'll spray the canopy frame in German grey. And once that's dry, I'll give the aircraft and its engine a coat of white primer. This not only helps the paint to stick down, but it also helps to highlight imperfections or areas that I missed while filling and sanding. Once the primer's dry, I'm able to fix the imperfections and apply another coat of primer. And when that second coat of primer's dry, I start on the pre-shading. This helps to give a shadow effect, especially around panel lines or around recessed areas like the wing roots. If you want to pre-shade a model, it helps to put it in a bright spot and see how the light falls on it before you start. This helps you to see where the shadows are cast and as a result, where to concentrate your pre-shading efforts. Once I've finished pre-shading, it's time to apply the colour coats. The paintwork on the HE162 is fairly simple. Unlike the eye-popping splotches and squiggles found on other Luftwaffe camouflage schemes, the underside of the HE162 gets painted in light blue. And the upper surfaces are NATO green. Pay close attention to the paint instructions though, because on the aircraft I'm modelling, there's a thin band of light blue on the leading edges of the wings. It wasn't too hard to mask off, but due to the small size of the diagram in the instructions, you need to take care to make sure you don't overlook it. The aircraft I was modelling had three coloured stripes on the nose. Unfortunately, only the rear black stripe was included on the decal sheet. That meant I had to airbrush the nose cone in white and due to the compound curves making it hard to mask, paint the red stripe at the end of the nose by hand. This was quite tedious and if I'm honest, my stripes aren't perfectly neat when viewed close up. If Dragon had included all three stripes on the decal sheet, rather than just the last one, this could have been quite a bit easier. I left the paint, stripes included, to dry for a couple of days, and then gave the whole aircraft a gloss clear coat to protect it. Once the clear coat had fully dried, I started applying the decals. The decals in this kit were made by Cartograph, a company with a reputation for producing high quality markings. And the markings in this kit certainly live up to the high standards they're known for. Every one of the markings, from the big black crosses on the wings to the tiny information placards and squadron insignia, went on with no problems, and didn't require much decal solution to get them to conform to the surface details. And I have to commend Dragon too for not going overboard on the number of decals. Couple that with a paint diagram that very clearly shows how and where each marking should be placed. And overall, I was quite pleased with the decals on this model. Though I still want all three stripes on the nose. Please, it's just easier.
Once I'd finished applying the decals, I airbrushed the model with a flat clear coat. This protects the decals and prepares the surface of the model for weathering. I let the clear coat dry and then started weathering the airframe. Initially, I just used pigment powder to add streaks of dust and grime at the edges of panels and on the underside of the fuselage. Because of the aircraft's short service life, I kept the weathering fairly light initially, but after looking at pictures of aircraft online that were in the process of being restored, I decided to add more layers of weathering. After all, I am building this aircraft with all the panels opened up, so why not make it look as if it's part way through a restoration? After my weathering was complete, I gave the aircraft a semi-gloss clear coat removed the masking in the canopy and wheel wells and began final assembly. I started off the final assembly process by gluing on the landing gear doors. These parts fitted together very well, although do pay close attention to which way you attach the main landing gear doors. Remember, the narrow end goes towards the front. The instructions call for the attachment of photo etched metal braces, parts M2 and M4, between the wheel bays and the landing gear doors themselves. However, I couldn't find any assemblies that looked like this on photos or diagrams of the real aircraft, so I just left them off. With the glue drying on the landing gear doors, I turned my attention to the wheels and tyres. I'd sprayed them in RLM02 earlier on, when I painted the landing gear bays, so all that I needed to do now was paint the tyres in NATO black, and then glue the wheels onto the landing gear. The fit of the wheels was excellent, and the wheels themselves were reasonably detailed and looked quite nice after applying a black panel line wash. I also detail painted the engine by picking out components in different colours and airbrushing clear blue paint around the combustion chambers to simulate the effects of heat. All that I had to do to finish off the engine was attach the air intake on the front and the rear cowling section on the, well, on the rear. The intake fitted in place well, and the rear cowling section only needed a small amount of sanding to clean up the seam in the middle. With the seam smoothed out, and the paintwork touched up, I could finally attach this beautiful little engine to the top of the aircraft. There was a small gap between the intake and the engine mounting, but because it's so hard to see, and even harder to access, I didn't really worry too much about filling it. What I did decide to do though, was reattach the rear section of the aircraft's canopy, this time in the open position. The canopy will stay open of its own accord, but Dragon included a photo etched metal rod to simulate the device seen on some aircraft used to prop open the canopy. Unfortunately, the attachment pins on the back of my canopy were a bit too wide to fit in their respective holes. That meant I could only display the canopy sort of half open, but it still looks pretty good. In hindsight, I should have test fitted the canopy in the open position before I glued it in place to start painting. With the canopy in place, the only sub-assembly left to add was the two halves of the engine cowling. The instructions weren't exactly clear about how these were to be attached to the fuselage, but I was able to figure it out while test fitting the parts. The cowling sections look good, with nice moulded in detail. Unfortunately though, there's two massive and very noticeable pin markings on each section that are right in plain sight with the canopy open. 
because I couldn't find a way to remove the pin markings without destroying the moulded detail around them, and besides I was just keen to finish the build, I left them as they were. But if you're planning to build this aircraft for a competition or a museum or somewhere where the accuracy will be judged, you will need to spend a bit more time and effort getting the cowlings cleaned up before you paint and attach them. Anyway, once the cowlings are in place, the HE-162 is all done. So while we wait for the glue to dry, let's go over the review scores. We'll start off by talking about the quality of the parts, and in general I was pretty pleased. The parts were moulded very cleanly, with not much flash and a lot of detail, especially for a kit that was first released 30 years ago. I'm a really big fan of the fully detailed engine Dragon provides in this kit, and judging from the pictures I found online at least, the shape and detail on Dragon's tiny turbojet is very accurate to what's present on the real aircraft. The only issues I had with the parts in this kit were that the canopy was slightly hazy out of the box, and that I would have preferred some of the photo etched metal parts, like the instrument panel and landing gear components, to be made out of plastic. But, on the whole, I'd say the parts in this kit deserve a 4 out of 5. Now we move on to the instructions, and to be honest I found these to be kind of hit and miss. The main assembly stages were very clear and easy to understand, as was the guide for placing the markings, but some of the instructions for the sub-assemblies could have used a lot more information. Pictures of the completed sub-assembly, for instance, would, in my opinion, clarify how different parts and components are supposed to interact with each other. Also, I'm not really a fan of Dragon indicating different paint colours with different shades of blue. This did get quite confusing, and in some places made it hard to tell the difference between two areas of different colour. But, on the whole, I thought the instructions did a good job of showing you how to build this kit. And that's why I gave them a 3 out of 5. So that brings us on to construction, which, like the instructions we just talked about, gets a 3 out of 5. On the whole, the kit was quite pleasant to build. I especially liked putting together the details on some of the sub-assemblies. But this really isn't a kit for beginners. Bending and shaping the photo etched metal to fit into place can be a bit of a challenge, and the fit and finish of parts like the engine halves and cowlings did leave a bit to be desired. But the reason I didn't want to mark this kit any higher is because of just how small everything is. Advanced modelers may not have much of a problem with it, but for beginners and intermediate builders, this kit will present a real challenge. Anyway, let's talk about the decals, which, as I mentioned earlier, were really nice. The markings and colours were well printed, and the decals themselves were easy and trouble free when it came to applying them. However, while you can make a nice looking HE-162 with the decals provided, I do feel like there should have been a couple more markings, especially for areas like the stripes on the nose and the instrument panel. But, because of how nice the markings in this kit were, I'm giving the decals an overall score of 4 out of 5. And now to our final category, value for money, the place where this kit really shines. See, even though it's been out of production for a few years, I was able to purchase my example for $26.95 Australian. That's about $19.30 in the US, and at the time of this video, $19.30 in Euros as well. Most aircraft kits with the kind of detail and photo etched metal that this kit comes with tend to be quite a bit more expensive. But, unfortunately, the market seems to have realised that, as these kits do appear to be climbing in price. But, for the price I paid, I'd give it a 4.5 out of 5 in value. And when you put all those scores together, we get a total score of 18.5 out of 25. Which means that not only do I recommend this kit, but it comes in at second place on the leaderboard, just half a point away from Italeri's F-22. And with that, the review portion of this video is complete. I hope you enjoyed the video and maybe even learnt something. If you did, why not leave a like or share your thoughts in the comments? But before you do that, stick around, because I'm about to show you the finished model. All that's left for me to say is that my name's Terry, I've been the board modeler, and this is the HE162A2 Volksjäger by Dragon in 1-70 second scale. Thanks for watching, and happy modeling.